Now, I was, there's been a bit of a back and forth. Um, I was meant to do a special item, and then we switched it with the, with the choir because they were going. Um, so I'm going to do the special item just before the sermon. Don't worry, it's just a special item, it's not the sermon. But it is linked to it. Um, as you can, you may probably tell, I came back with a flu and a crackly throat. So listen to the words, not the voice. Um, hopefully you'll be blessed. It's an old Negro spiritual. It's called Nobody's Fault But Mine. Nobody's fault but mine. Nobody's fault but mine And if I die and my soul be lost It's nobody's fault but mine I've got a Bible I can read if I choose I've got a Bible I can read if I choose. So if I die and my soul be lost, it's nobody's fault but mine. God has sent his son. Jesus has paid the price. The Holy Ghost has entreated my soul. It's nobody's fault but mine. Angels have watched over me night and day. Angels have watched over me night and day. And if I die, my soul be lost. It's nobody's fault but mine. Nobody's fault but yours and mine. Nobody's fault but yours and mine. And if we die and our souls be lost, it's nobody's fault, nobody's fault, nobody's fault but yours and mine. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come before you this Sabbath morning, ready to hear your word, ready to hear you speak, Lord, I am an unclean vessel made of dirt. I ask that you will speak through me, that your words may be lifted up. For your word says, if Christ is lifted up, all men will be drawn to him. Pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. That is a song my wife loves and I find very powerful because it's simple and true. Um, someone once said, you know, many of us go through many things in life, and some people say, well, I'm this way because of my background. I'm this way because of the challenges I went through. Someone said, once you hit the age of 30, you are the background. You are the challenges. You, you can only pull that for so long. So if we're lost, it's no one's fault. Not Christ, not God. It's us. So we want to talk about the first angel's message. And as is my custom, I started going into the words and got lost in the words a bit. So I won't take you down those rabbit holes. There are many, they're deep, and they lead you to a very scary place. But we'll, we'll come closer to home and try and figure out who is an Adventist. Now, first of all, we're going to reference Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. God says, come now, let us reason together. So I want for us to reason, Okay. I want for us to go along this journey and try and understand. If I asked how many of us here are Seventh-day Adventists, most of you would put your hands up. But I want us to go through it and see, are we really Seventh-day Adventists? Do we know what being Seventh-day Adventists is? So, origins, always a good place to start. 
If we look at the origin of our church, we can date it back to the cross. But it's not that simple. When I was checking on this, I said, oh, let me find something that's comparable. The Adventist church has been in existence since 1863, and I went into the origins of Australia. And, yeah, Australia is much older than the Adventist church by any scale of measure. So I went back as far as I could, and it started at the cross because Adventists, by profession of faith, are Christians. Amen? So that means we follow Christ. And so Christ died, and anyone who's been following the lesson is aware that we're looking. We looked at the crucifixion this week, a very harrowing, very solemn aspect of our faith. And he died in 33 AD. There's a lot of debate out there. Some people say 27 AD, some say 30 AD, some say 33, 34, it doesn't matter. 33 AD, good enough, we'll go with that. And then the early Christian church, so if you remember, three and a half years after Christ died, Stephen was stoned, and then the message went out to the whole world, okay? So three and a half puts you at about 37 AD, and that went all the way to 325 AD. This is the time in which the church grew in leaps and bounds. But something interesting was going on with the church. The church was becoming um, an organization. It stopped being a movement. So there's a whole discussion on what a movement versus organization is. We won't go into that. But Catholicism, as we know it, after the Council of Nicaea, sort of took hold from 325 AD on. And any Adventist who spent more than a few you know, weeks in church will know that image. And that's the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And Catholicism sort of arose beyond the thighs going towards the feet. Okay? And that's where you had Rome, and then the Roman Catholic Church came in. And we are all, of course, looking forward to that rock coming and getting rid of all of this. Now, Luther... Luther went to Wittenberg, nailed 95 theses on the church. That's Martin Luther, for those who don't know. And that was the beginning of the Protestant movement. So we can sort of trace our history from the cross through the Catholic Church into Lutheranism and on till Adventism. Now, Interestingly enough, the Church of England is part of our heritage because the Church of England separated and they said it was, in my mind, a fairly awkward reason. Henry VIII wanted to marry someone and they, the church said, no, you can't. And he said, what? I'll set up my own church. And he did. And the Church of England came forth. Why is that relevant? Because baptism came from the Church of England. The Baptist Church originated from the Church of England. And that now brings us closer through the Millerite movement now. The Millerite movement are people who went and studied the Word of God and said, hang on, there's a 2300-day prophecy. And if we look at this, Christ is coming. And we can figure out the day. He is definitely coming, October 22nd, 1844. We're still here, so we know that didn't work out. That was called the Great Disappointment. And then from there, the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1863. So that's your history. Um, where we come from, there's a whole process about marriage. I was telling some guys this. There's a friend of mine who met a lady and thought she was very nice. And he you know, spent time with her and said, this is it. So they went for introductions. Now the first introductions is the young guy goes to the lady's home and says, oh, we have seen a flower and we would like to know where the flower came from. And they say, okay, we've heard you. Go and bring your people. So the people came. That's the second meeting. It's like six or seven meetings. It's a very onerous thing, but, you know, it sort of reduces the rates of divorce. So the second meeting... He came with his parents and some grandparents, and they started. And part of it is to start saying, I am so-and-so, or the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, and you go like six, seven generations back. And the reason for that is for people to be very clear on who you are. 
Now the problem my friend had is, as soon as he finished introducing himself, the other side started whispering. They were like, what's going on? So apparently this was his third cousin or something that he fancied. And they said, yeah, this can't go forward. And um, being good Adventists, they went to the church and said, there's something wrong here. But it was settled. That's not the purpose of the sermon. The purpose of this is to say, we need to know our origins. When you find yourself at loggerheads with someone on doctrinal issues, you may just be arguing with your third cousin. Okay. So, the Seventh-day component of Seventh-day Adventists, and there's a beautiful story about how the name Seventh-day Adventists came to be. There was, a, there was a great discussion. You can tell from 1844 to 1863, you're dealing with about 19 years in which time the Adventist church doesn't have a name. And people are preaching out there and saying things, and it's becoming a problem. And the church did not want to become an institution. They wanted to remain, to remain a movement. But there are people who are keeping the seventh day. The Waldensi is a very, I mean, amazing place to visit if you ever have the opportunity in Switzerland. They were basically told they wanted to keep the Sabbath, and the Catholic Church said no. But there was a rule that was given that you cannot keep the Sabbath below a certain altitude. So they lived up in the mountains. And you couldn't walk with the Bible freely, so they memorized the Bible. And they would send people into town who could share the Bible from memory and then go back up. As long as you're above a certain altitude, the government wouldn't touch you. But everyone, of course, lived at the low altitude. The Waldensians kept the Sabbath all through, but they were not Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh-day Baptists, they've been around for a long time. And in fact, Ellen White worshipped on Sunday. The message of Sabbath came through the Seventh-day Baptists. So that's where you can credit Sabbath keeping. I have an interesting story about the Church of God Seventh Day. Well, it's interesting to me. I was in another country at one point and I looked for a church, as I always do. You go to a new place, you look for a church, you feel at home. It doesn't always work, but more often than not it does. So I was going to this church and it, I needed to go on a train, a tram, a bus, and I said, this is too much. So I went on Google, you know, look for a Seventh Day Church. And there was one just behind where I lived and I said, ah, oh, perfect. So I went there one day and I sat down and there was something different. They're all very friendly and everything. So they said, okay, we are going to sing hymn number this. I opened my hymnal. It wasn't that one. I said, okay. Kept singing, kept singing. I said, you know, campus melodies, whatever. Then they went into the lesson discussion. I pulled out my lesson. We were not on the same lesson. And their church, they, they, sat, they sat in a circle. There was no sort of pew arrangement. And the lesson discussion went for two and a half hours. And as it was nearing lunchtime, I said, okay, first of all, I don't know what these guys are talking about, but something's off with this church. And I said, let me pop out for lunch, because they said, yeah, the sermon's in the afternoon. So when I went out, it said, Church of God, Seventh Day. Then I was like, oh, okay, okay, okay. So a church that worships on Sabbath isn't always Seventh-day Adventist. And there was a guy in our school who came in, and he used to worship on Saturday, but he wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist. But there was no one else in the school who worshipped on Saturday, so he was just subsumed into it. So Church of God, Seventh-day, very alive, very active. Started in the U.S., it's in the U.K. as well. Davidians. Davidians are actually Adventists who broke off from being Adventists. And they, it was sort of an offshoot. And there's some dark things that happened with some of these sects and branches. Um, but let's keep going. So Adventist. Adventist is a very simple term. Uh, right at the bottom, ad means to, veneer is to come. So it is people who are looking forward to the coming of Christ. Okay? We are not the only Adventists, by the way. So I don't know if this projects well, but after the great disappointment, there were several offshoots from the church. We are the top one, but then there are several others. The Church of God Seventh Day is in there, and several others. Some have, some have died off, some are still going. The point is, 
a number of them worship on Saturday, a number of them are Adventist. So why are you in this church? This is a question that I want you to think about. You can keep the Sabbath in Church of God's Seventh Day. You can be an Adventist in the Advent Christians or the Adventist Christian Church or the Russell Bible Students or the Life and Advent Union. Why are you here? Is it because it's close to where you live? Good reason. Not always the best reason as I found out when I traveled. But it's important for us to know why we are here because if you don't know why you are here, you will be lost. And people get lost while they are at home. How many of us know people who are raised in a home but got lost under the care of their parents? People can get lost while at home. You can be in the pews and get lost if you don't know why you're in the pews. So, this used to be our old logo. It was changed and we won't go into the drama of all that. But it was very simple, the three angels message. Yeah? Revelation 14, 6 to 12. And today we're going to look at the first angel's message. Now, that's just figuring out what an angel is. An angel is a messenger. So anytime God sends an angel, it's with a message. Whether it was killing the firstborns in Egypt, whether it was to Elizabeth, a messenger is sent with a message from God. So, this is the first angel's message. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of waters. That's the first angel's message. That is what the Adventist church calls its great commission. How do you feel when you see that message? Does it excite you? Do you, do you see that fear God and give glory and worship him for the hour of his judgment has come? Do you go, yes, it's about time? Or do you go, hey, 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 hey. I don't know about the judgment bit. I'm, I'm okay with fearing him, worshiping him. I'm not okay with his judgment. Because that should help you understand why are you a Seventh-day Adventist. If the message which we proclaim fills you with fear, fills you with anxiety, fills you with worry, are you a Seventh-day Adventist? How will you give this message if you don't want it yourself? There's, I like ice cream. I shouldn't, but I do. And my children know that I like ice cream. I like it more than them. So when we're in the Cook Islands, we were walking and it was hot and we're in town and I saw an ice cream parlor and I thought to myself, I've been working. I, should, I, I deserve this. And I told my youngest, do you want ice cream? She said, it's not time for eating. I don't want ice cream. <laughs> so I had a situation on my hands. Now, do I, do I corrupt the little child to get my ice cream or do I just, you know, <sighs> yes. So she, she rebuked me. I didn't have ice cream that day. I thank the Lord. I thank the Lord now. At that time, I wasn't very happy. But the message that she has received from me and my wife, she holds fast to. And for me, I'm like, yeah, but it's conditional. I don't like that message when I'm in an island and it's hot. Anyway, so the message that we have, how does it make you feel? And not in an intellectual sort of way, in an emotional sort of way. Do, you, do we look forward to Christ's coming? Because that's what the Advent is. Seventh day is very easy. Everyone here, the fact that you're here means you're not at work, you're not at a family gathering, you're not at whatever. You're here. So people in your circles know that you're different. How do they know that you're different? For most of us, you don't go to work on Saturday. Or you make a fuss if you have to. And they will know, you know, you'll wag a finger. And then, for some of us, there's certain foods we won't eat. 
and they know, oh, well, I, I had an aunt who used to do that. She, she looked at me and she said, now what will I cook for you? I don't know what to cook for you. And I said, cook for yourself what you would normally eat and I'll eat the vegetables around what you normally eat. And it worked. But how many of the people who know us know about the Adventist bit? How many of the people who know us know that we are looking forward to Christ's return? And if they don't, are we Seventh-day Baptists? Are we Seventh-day Lutherans? That doesn't exist, but it might as well. We, we need to know what we stand for. Now, here's another question. The three angels' message, who gives the message? Is it a literal angel flying in the midst of heaven? Is it... Because we know in the book of Revelation, a woman is a church, right? So then we say that we are meant to give the message. But the Bible says that I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. So who gives this message? That's a question that we need to figure out. Is it a church? Is it an angel? If it's an angel, then we don't need to do anything. Because we should be waiting for that angel to fly and say, okay, yeah, there he goes, fear God, give. Yep, that's one. Where's the second guy? Babylon, okay. Where's the third guy? Okay, good. Christ is coming. Are we waiting for that? Is that what's going to happen? Or are we meant to give that message? So, the Great Commission. Christ said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. The Great Commission, this is what Christ told his church to do, is go and teach all nations. The first angel message says, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth in all nations. If you sit around waiting for the first angel to come and fly across the heavens, you might miss your commission. We are the ones to give that message. We're not waiting on an angel to fly across like, you know, I don't want to name any airline lest I'm barred from flying. Some airline, the Concorde. We're not waiting for a Concorde to fly across and say, hey, you know, fear God and give glory to him. No, we're the ones to do it. That's our great commission. Now, why should we teach? Because it says teaching them. I, I got the chance to teach my son some math. And it was fun, because I like math. Math is one of my favorite subjects. And he was struggling with, you know, squaring and prime numbers and that sort of thing. And I was like, look, it's easy. And I have all these ways of, this is how you figure out if a number is divisible by 11, divisible by 7. And he was just looking at me like, what? So I, we drew the entire multiplication table and I showed him how to add and he said adding I can do multiplication is a challenge. And in my mind I thought to myself, what will he do when I tell him that letters come into math? Because we're doing numbers. Then I'll say 3a plus 4b, he'll be like, hang on, dad, dad, there are no letters in the multiplication table. What are we doing? But we're meant to teach. I'll give you an example. In the same message, it says, Fear God and give glory to him. But Timothy says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear. So either, either God's confused, or we don't understand it. But if we don't understand it, how will others understand it from us? Are we together? If you don't, if, if this is making you go, Hmm. Huh, Imagine someone you're trying to explain this to. And why should you explain this? Because we are co-laborers with Christ. This is from Ellen White. She actually said in Signs of the Times, and it's also recorded in the last day events, that there'll be no one saved in heaven with a starless crown. What does this mean? Anyone who goes into heaven will have someone in heaven who is there because of an influence of theirs. If you do not influence anyone on this earth to get to heaven, you may not make it to heaven. The Great Commission isn't a hobby. The Great Commission isn't a suggestion. The Great Commission is an instruction. So when we are Seventh-day Adventists, 
The seventh day is not the thing you proclaim. The thing you proclaim is the Adventist. And if people only know you for the seventh day and they don't know you for the Adventist, you might miss the mark. You might be lost while at home. So, the question that's asked there is, why would you not entreat the Lord to put upon you, this is a question to yourself, his spirit, that you may be able to awaken an interest in the truth in the minds of those around you? And it doesn't mean you have to go to far off lands. It's literally looking at your family circle, your friend's circle, and saying, when last did I share Jesus with them? When last did I share my faith with them? And if I'm not sharing my faith with them, what am I doing? Am I a Seventh-day Adventist? So, there is also the discussion on why should you do this. It's not up to us to do, you know, I don't, I don't need to come to Sophie and say, Sophie, you need to accept Jesus Christ. You need to accept. And then I, I'm on her every day until she's baptized. And I say, hallelujah, check. Now I can relax. Cool running. We are told, 1 Corinthians 3.8, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. You just have to do the work. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts souls. But we are the ones to do the work. We have to do the work. Yes, for them, but especially for us. Yes, for them, but especially for us. Because there needs to be a star in our crown. There's a song that goes, will there be any stars in my crown? It's actually, you know, it's a, trepid, it's a trepidatious song because it's saying, if I'm doing nothing for Christ, then is my faith dead? Because faith without action is dead. So, we're coming to a close. There are three types of Christians. And I find this very well described in Judges chapter 2, verse 7 and 10. Now, the book of Judges comes after the book of Joshua. For those who remember Joshua, Caleb and Joshua, after the Israelites left uh, the wilderness and they got into Canaan, Moses didn't get there because, you know, he struck the rock. Caleb and Joshua were the faithful, the faithful spies who, when all the others were scared, they said, no, we can take that land. Now, Judges chapter 2 verse 7 talks about the death of Joshua. It says, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. So this is the first Christian. Joshua lived his faith. He practiced his faith. He was true to the commission that he had. Then there's a second group. Joshua. And then there was the elders that outlived Joshua, okay? So we have two groups, Joshua and those who actually made it into the promised land, and then the elders who were there and lived beyond Joshua's time. Both of these people, they saw all the things that God did for Israel. Joshua experienced it, he lived through it, but the elders who outlived him, some of them just found their way into Canaan, because if we recall, the Israelites who were in the wilderness, many of them died in the wilderness. It was a different generation that got into Canaan. This is what happened. The third one, sorry, the first two, all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and that's all that we hear about them. They were gathered unto their fathers, so they died. And then arose another generation after them. This is the Christians who do neither. They neither live their Christianity, nor do they observe what they should do as Christians. This generation did not know the Lord. That's number one. And number two, they didn't even know the works. So they didn't live their faith, so they didn't know God. Number two, because they were not even interested in the things of God, they did not know about God. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baal. 
this is this is a very scary thing. These are this is not two hundred years after. There's Joshua, there's children, grandchildren serving Baal in Canaan. In Canaan. So I'll close this with another story. In the same place I had traveled to, I went and I told them, look, I'm very happy to do the work, but I will not work on Saturday. And they said, oh, why? I said, I have to go to church on Saturday. They said, yeah, that's fine, that's fine, that's not an issue. And then there was a lady of um, Southeast Asian origin, and she came to me later and she said, you go to church? I said, yeah. Why? I said, because that's what I believe, that's what I practice. She told me, she was very shocked. Why? Because she was Hindu. And during Easter, her daughter came home and asked her, who is Jesus? And she was like, oh, Jesus, you know, he, he died for the Christians. And she goes, what do you mean he died? And the mother is like, yeah, he was crucified, and that's why there's Easter, because he was crucified, he died, he res resurrected. How, what is crucifixion? Why did he die? And so this lady, she's Hindu, born, raised, and she's raising her children in the Hindu faith. And it's not Hindu faith, but I didn't go into the specific faiths that they have. And she starts explaining Christianity to her non-Christian child in her non-Christian home. And she came and asked me, why do you go to church? And I said, because I've always gone to church. It's, it's what I do. She said, in that country, they no longer preach, um, they no longer speak of God in their schools. It's not allowed. And the children don't profess their faith. And so she found it very odd that her, who is not a Christian, is explaining the principles of Christianity to her daughter, who is not a Christian. And she said that told her that the children in the class don't follow the Christian faith. Now, they all check off that they're Christians. So when they ask, they say, oh, yeah, there's about 80% Christians, you know, 10% Muslims, and, you know, 10% other. But none of those people had told her daughter what Easter is about, who Christ is. And so this person who, she said she knew this because her classmates told her about Easter and Christ and Christianity when she was growing up. But now she had to teach her daughter about Easter and the crucifixion and Christ, because none of the Christians would do it. The Bible says that even the stones will rise and testify. How many of us don't share, and by so doing miss the chance to share God's word to the people around us? So. My admonition for today is, I pray that we'll ask ourselves, are we Christians who live our faith? Are we Christians who observe our faith? Or are we Christians who neither live or observe? Because the Bible tells us we will do evil in the sight of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for being here. We thank you for your word that you've given to us freely. If we die and our souls are lost, it'll be nobody's fault but ours. But Lord, it is not only our souls, it is all the souls in every nation and kindred and tongue who need to hear from our lips that they should fear God and give glory to him, that they should worship you, Lord, how will they know if they're not told? How will they be told if we don't speak? Lord, we pray for our salvation. We pray for the salvation of our families and friends. And Lord, we pray for conviction and courage to not just worship you on the seventh day, but to proclaim your soon return. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.